You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Ask Drone You. I am here with Haya Costello from Drone DJ to deliver this week's drone news. Haya, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me, Paul. How are you? Doing well, doing well. It has been yeah. extremely busy over here. We've been training back to back to back. We're even headed to Dallas next week to do another training. How are you? Very good, very good. Trying to keep up with all the drone news that's happening uh, in the world. And there's been a lot of stuff going on again, like every week. There is so much going on, hidden and unhidden. And we're mm-hmm. really excited to bring this week's drone news to us. So for the first piece of news this week, big regulatory news comes from the U.S. government. What do you have? Yeah, this has to do with remote ID for drones. Uh, Brendan Schulman, who is the chief legal guy at DJI, if you uh, if you might say, uh, he tweeted yesterday that the remote ID rulemaking has been postponed by three months. And I kind of dove into that a little bit. Apparently, the U.S. Um, Department of Transportation issues a Word document with all the updates of all the different rules that they're currently working on. And one, it's it's a pretty lengthy document actually. I think it's about a hundred pages. And in one of those sections, they do talk about remote identification for drones. And uh, the original date for the publication of the new rules would have been May 1st, 2019. And then there's a comment period in which uh, people from the industry as well as the general public can put in their feedback. That was going to last until June 1st. However, both those dates have been pushed back. So the new publication date now is July 21st. And then the end of comment period has been pushed back to October 29th. And the thing that Brandon Schulman pointed out is that uh, remote ID for drones is kind of the first legal hurdle that needs to be taken before they can move on and finalize the rules for things such as flying your drone over crowds as well as flying at night. So... Hence, those things are likely to be pushed forward into the future as well. Seems like a pretty significant development that Brendan Schulman, chief counsel at DJI, is saying, hey, this is unfortunate, as he tweeted. But I think it's also significant, like you said, because remote ID is essentially the building block, the foundation of the house of these new regulations that are coming out. But if I read your article correctly, it seems like this remote ID may also hamper the flight over people operations and nighttime operations. It seems that way. And uh, I mean, remote ID is something that's also heavily uh, pushed by uh, the Department of Justice and Homeland Security. They want to be able to to identify unmanned flying objects and also uh, know who is controlling those devices. Uh, so remote ID is like the the entry points into commercial drone operations. And then once we solve remote ID, we can then move on and finalize rules for flying during the night and flying over crowds as well. So a lot of the commercial drone applications that technically are ready to be implemented are being held back because of all these regulations. And now we have another three month delay, which is uh, unfortunate. Unfortunate to say the least. Do you believe that this delay is a factor of the government shutdown from earlier this year? That's a good point. Um, Might very well have been. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to rule that out, I think. Well, in other news, it seems like there is a lot changing in this industry, not only legislatively speaking, but also it seems like the mechanics behind some of our most basic sensors in drones will be seeing a very large update in April. What do you have for us? Yeah, this has to do with the global positioning system. And apparently there is a, this year there's a GPS 2019 week rollover. And when I first read that, I was like, what the heck is a week rollover? But apparently the way this works is the way that they count weeks is a 10 bit binary number. So they start with week number zero and then they count to 1023 and then they have to start the cycle all over again. So when they first introduced uh, the GPS system, and this was back in January of uh, 1980, They were able to run the cycle until 99, then they had to reset it again, and now we're at the end of the second cycle. 
So April 6th is going to be uh, the transition, basically, when we roll back to zero and start counting all over again. Uh, DJI just had a very brief statement yesterday pointing this out and saying that their drones were heavily tested and are all ready to go and that nobody should experience any issues with their DJI products. However, interestingly enough, uh, and I'll read you one of the comments on Drone DJ, uh, where somebody said that um, my DJI Inspire 2 has never recorded the right date in metadata anyway, so I expect no changes. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess either way, uh, any DJI pilot should feel safe. <laughs> yeah, they should feel safe. It's interesting. It seems like we're having deja vu with Y2K. If, no, <laughs> if all over 19, again. <laughs> yeah. 1999 strikes back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... Uh, to me, it sounds like, uh, yeah, the year 2000. It's probably not going to be a big deal. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's news for sure, and it's something to keep an eye on. And I would recommend, too, to anyone who's flying a DJI Autel or Unique, it would probably be in your best interest just to conduct a compass calibration on April 5th, 6th, and 7th just to ensure that your drones are operating properly. It never hurts to do that. So, But it looks like there is some really fun stuff on the horizon. Maybe not for U.S. drone pilots, but it seems like the Europeans are once again ahead of the crowd. What do you have for us, Haya? Yeah, this, this is really cool. And um, this took place in the Netherlands last weekend where they held an event called Drone Clash. And Drone Clash basically is robo wars, but now taken to the skies. Uh, you have drones fighting each other. And the whole idea is to try out and test new technology and get uh, students and, and young drone pilots involved to come up with uh, innovative ways and ideas to have drones fight other drones and basically use that as a... Uh, idea generator to uh, use it for counter drone technology and um, it's funny like in the Netherlands even the Dutch police the Dutch Ministry of Defense and the Dutch version of MIT which is the uh, University of Delft a technical university are all involved and sponsored this event the winners took home a 30,000 uh, euro uh, first prize which is significant money to uh, then use to develop new drone toys so it's, it's, it's kind of a big deal. And uh, if you look at the videos on YouTube, the stuff that they come out with is quite amazing. Like you have drones flying with torches trying to burn down other drones midair. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of netting systems going on. So people get really creative trying to figure out a way to take down another drone. See, this looks like so much fun. And after watching the video, it seems like if you're also a really good pilot, that you could excel significantly in this challenge. Yeah. Because a lot of these drones have nets under them. They're not protecting the propellers. And it seems yeah. like if you have a lot of maneuverability, you could really be in a powerful position here. And it, frankly, I think this is really cool because, I mean, even... I would love to get involved with this. Could you imagine a drone using a thermal camera to then just literally use a heat sink to notice where the battery is, little laser, <laughs> boop, and you literally You're take out them. each drone. <laughs> I mean, what was, are turning. I get it. <laughs> yeah, what would you do, Haya? I don't know. I, th I think having a very agile, fast drone would be would be very good. I'd like to have a drone that uh, would spit out like a little net. So you fly towards something and just spit a net out and just capture the other drone and have it crash. I think I would go some for something like that. Oh my gosh, I need to get Indemnis on board because they have a ballistic parachute and literally just point it forward. <laughs> there you go. But you'd only have one parachute. Yeah, but I mean, it's funny because I, I, I actually, I am from the town next to where this event took, took place and I had no idea that this was happening, but apparently it's already in the second year and they're planning to do it again next year. So next year, for sure, I want to be there. But to me, the, the other question is like, why the heck aren't we doing stuff like this in the U.S.? That is a very good question because Death Race is only a movie and not in real life. <laughs> <But I'm, laughs> I'm just saying I would love to participate. I think oh, this yeah. would be fantastic. Yeah, and I, I imagine all the, all the drone pilots and students you have in the U.S. who would come up with ideas and get their drones out. I mean, I think it would be awesome. Yeah, I think I'm going to be calling Peter here soon, and we might actually uh, we might get involved in this ourselves. But it is interesting how the Dutch Ministry of Defense is using this as ways yeah. to further advance counterintelligence. And it also looks like they may not be the only country in Europe that's utilizing counter-UAS intelligence. So what is Operation Zenith? What do you have for us? 
Operation Zenith is um, slightly different. DJI was involved as well. This took place in Manchester Airport in the UK, uh, where DJI showcased Aeroscope, uh, of course, their drone identification system. The goal of Operation Zenith was to see if you can merge air traffic management with unmanned air traffic management, to see if you can have both worlds talking to each other and have drones as well as airplanes and helicopters use the same airspace at the same time. Of course, DJI was involved. They used it to showcase Aeroscope and also showcase how Aeroscope could be part of a bigger system, um, integrated into existing systems as well as a standalone solution. And there's a video that's, and this was kind of interesting as well, is that um, DJI published a video unlisted on YouTube. So if you search for it, you wouldn't even be able to find it. I stumbled across it and it's kind of like a semi-promotional video of Aeroscope. I mean, if you don't know what Aeroscope is, it's a good video for sure. Uh, for the people that are familiar, I don't know if watching it is going to add that much to it. But the interesting thing, of course, is that uh, especially when you look at commercial drone applications, having drones use the same airspace as manned aviation is always going to be a challenge. And to make headway in uh, in that space, I think, is a, is a very positive thing. Yeah, it's very interesting. Although I'm really curious as to the deployment of such a system in the United States with current wiretapping laws, you know, 18 U.S.C. 32, makes it very clear that any capturing of electronic data is wiretapping. But on top of that, I'd also be interested in how plausible this system is because it's a library-based system and it's limited mm. to DJI only. I know I actually attended the Aeroscope launch in DC. I believe it was a year and a half ago now. And they showcase oh, that in the future, you know, hey, we expect Unique, we expect Autel to be visible on this system. Yeah. But until that happens um, and until we have systems that are not library-based systems, I think that the implementation of this in the United States may be limited, but I could be wrong. I don't know. I think um, it's also a matter of, of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. And I think DJI is playing that game as well. Um, I think it's probably unlikely that the U.S. government would pick the DJI Aeroscope system as a system to to work with. But then again, you don't you don't know. It's I mean, DJI is actively involved working with governments trying to come up with solutions, and I applaud them for that. And they were uh, the first and only drone manufacturer as of yet who came out with a solution to begin with. So that's a plus for sure. So let's see where this goes. Got to give them credit for sure. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting, Haya, because you said DJI is kind of throwing things against the wall and seeing what's sticking. And in this week's most recent DJI leaked photo, it definitely looks like things are being thrown out there to see what is sticking. And you yeah. know, Haya, I haven't been watching uh, VHS tapes for quite a while, but with <sighs> this contraption, it looks like times may be a change in. Um, totally. I have no idea to what to think of these images. I mean, there's a drawing that surfaced, which looks like a, uh, a drawing that you might find in a trademark or a patent application. Um, there's also an image of a stabilized gimbal camera device with uh, grips on the side. You can hold it uh, handheld. You can also hold it from the top. There's a little joystick. It has a uh, camera mounted on it that looks like it comes from a Inspire. Osita LV, the guy who's been tweeting rumors in the past as well, and he's been right, he's been wrong. I think for the most part, he's been right. So it's kind of like where there's smoke, there's fire. He posted this image and even went as far as saying that there would be four zoom lenses and four prime lenses that would be available for this device. Um, I haven't been able to confirm that any other way. Uh, he also mentions the product name, Product 330, as a potential code name for this device. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, it kind of looks like a Frankenstein device, uh, if you will, because it's it's kind of put together from a lot of existing parts and pieces. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the Mavic 2, for instance, if you look at these sensors here at the front, the proximity sensors, you can see something similar on the front of that device. And you would wonder why you would need that on a handheld device. So it's an interesting photo. Uh, the fact that there's a drawing as well kind of adds to its credibility, I guess. But at the same time, you wonder what it is and if this is a legit DJI product. If it is, however, um, the timing is interesting, of course, because NAB is around the corner. So are we going to see this at NAB? Possibly. I mean, DJI is... I hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't be shocked if we saw it at NAB. And I definitely think that yeah. you're onto something because if you look at the way that this is shaped, so for those of you who are listening to us, 
on iTunes. Imagine you have a box about the size of a Mavic 2 case. And then you were to put that lengthwise and attach a TB50 battery on the back and a handle on the top with yeah. what looks like a Mavic little uh, thumb controller, yeah. maybe even a Ronin thumb controller. And then there's an extension out front that looks like one of those GoPro extensions that goes from 6 inches to 26 inches. And then there's an X7 on there, but the whole thing looks 3D printed. And frankly, if you remember the, uh, the Osmo Plus, where they also took the camera from uh, from the Inspire, for the Osmo Plus, you can get this Z control arm that kind of stabilizes your movement as you walk. And on the picture, as well as the drawing of this uh, Frankenstein device, it looks like you have a similar extension as well. So Interesting. they took a whole bunch of bits and pieces of existing DJI product, it seems, and then kind of morphed it into something new. Yeah, it could be a really interesting product. Uh, at the same time, if this turns out to be nothing, I, I wouldn't be surprised either. Yeah, I would, say, I would say this goes both ways. We were expecting a yeah. Ronin S Mini at CES and didn't see anything like this. But I definitely wouldn't say that this is the Ronin S Mini because as one of the commenters said on Facebook, where do I put the VHS tape? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I don't know if uh, April 1st falls on a different date in China, but I mean, they're a little early, I think, with, uh, with this uh, image. <laughs> April 1st. <laughs> oh, man, that is really funny. Well, it looks like there's only one last piece of news, yeah. and as a drone training company here at DroneU, it's something I'm actually really excited about. DJI has fundamentally changed... Uh, the form in which people can experience flight if they're brand new. So what do you have for us? Yeah, this was uh, about a week ago that DJI launched a new version of their DJI Flight Simulator software. And we first had a chance to try this out at Airworks uh, 2018 in Dallas, Texas last year. I was using it with somebody else and initially it felt weird flying the drones because the controls were not calibrated or not the sensitivity was off it felt so we kind of played around with that and then once we had it uh, sorted out yeah it feels pretty legit i mean you're flying different dji drones you can uh, fly different missions and really get a feel for what it's like to to fly a drone in real life and of course, you can practice the missions that you're actually going to do uh, later on. So it's very interesting software for sure. They now came out with a new version. Uh, we posted that article on uh, on Drone DJ last week, and it actually was one of the top articles that week, which I didn't really expect. But I think there's a lot of interest among people uh, using software like this. Uh, one caveat, though, is that it's not available for Apple products. So it's Windows only, as far as I understand. Man, yeah, that is, bit of a bummer. that is a big bummer for sure. But it is extremely exciting how you can add in your own environments, which actually yeah. uh, here at DroneU, we've already been doing that. And I agree with you that it still seems like the flight controls aren't completely true to flying outside. And I would say specifically the sensitivity on the yaw. That's one thing that I've noticed a lot is the sensitivity on the yaw doesn't seem to correlate mm -hmm. when you're injecting, say, like a banking turn where it's a combination of movements on yeah. the sticks. But I do like how you can plug in a phantom remote and just start going. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I bet you if you had that software, let's say, right there in your office and you're able to tweak it and fine tune it, you can probably get to the point where it, it becomes really useful training software. True, true. Couldn't agree so. more. Yeah. Well, Haya, this week's drone news is uh, like a roller coaster up and yeah. down from remote ID being delayed to the up of people crashing drones purposely into each other. And that is something that yeah. gets me excited. So, Haya, thank you so much for joining us on the show again today. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll be back next week with more news for you guys. Sounds good. And until then, that will do it for us today. Thanks again, everyone, for listening to another news episode from Ask Drone You with the help of Drone DJ. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.